Welcome, fellow anglers, to the Good Karma Sport Fishing Podcast. I am Captain Ryan Van Fleet, your host here in the Florida Keys. Each week, I bring you fishing tips, stories, gear reviews, and more to help you catch big fish and overall have fun. Do you guys remember when deep dropping was still kind of a mystery? <laughs> Meaning that nobody, there's, there's so much stuff getting tossed out there around it, but nobody really was like talking about it. Then all of a sudden you're seeing it on the forums uh, more and more. And then certain guys wanted to, were posting more and more about it. They're catching the gray tile fish. And then all of a sudden, man, the sport caught wildfire and it blew up. And next thing you know, um, everybody's owning an electric reel and it's just all this tackle that the tackle industry is making a fortune off guys like you and me <laughs> that want to get into the deep dropping thing. Guys, I got into deep dropping out of survival. <laughs> Meaning that years ago, I spent a couple of days fishing with a couple of um, very impatient Italians who spoke very <laughs> zero English. <laughs> oh my gosh! I, I'll the story came to my head, and you, I'll tell you why it came to my head here at the end of the um, at the podcast, but. Uh, anyways, these guys booked me for three days, and they kept telling me what to do in Italian, and they kept shouting at me, and I was like, I was very confused. I was, they kept yelling at me, no trolling, no trolling. And back then, I I did a lot of trolling because my clients wanted to target tunas on the troll. They wanted to target mahi on the troll. Now let me backtrack a little bit. Now the clients I had in when I first started charter fishing were clients that all they wanted to do was troll for dolphin, troll for dolphin, troll for dolphin, troll for wahoo, troll for wahoo, or yellowtail fish. And when I met the Italians, or I was like, I was very confused because I'd never had clients like these, and I just didn't know what they wanted. I was very confused because I hadn't had clients like <laughs> <laughs> these guys. So I wanted them to be happy. And so I just, and plus there was that English barrier. I just, I, I just, they knew very little English and I had no clue on how to speak any Italian. And in fact, that night I got home, I started like Googling words and like trying to figure out like how I can communicate with these guys to figure out what they wanted. So anyways, <sighs> Let me get back to it. So they they during the charter, I was trolling on the hump. I still remember this. And I was catching some really nice spring blackfin tuna. They were nice and fat, beautiful. Every pass over the hump, I was catching a big one. I had the downrigger set up. I was spanking them good. But these guys kept looking at me like every nice fish they'd reel in, they'd give me a, like a disgusted look. <laughs> I was just like, no smiles. I was like, what's happening here? I'm catching fish. They're nice fish. Um they they kept yelling at me, no troll, no troll. And I was like, that's all, that's what, what am I supposed to do? I just, so I, anyways, they were relentless on me and they kept bashing me in Italian. <laughs> and I wanted, I wanted to know so bad what they were, what they were saying. And like I said, they kept looking at me with disgust for every fish that I hooked and put over the rail for them. But. So I was just like, so I took some deep breaths and I was like, what do they want? So I remember watching some old like fishing shows and it was, they were, you know, fishing overseas. And I know that overseas, they, these guys, you know, they're, it's, they're very active in how they fish. So I was still like learning how to vertical jig. I didn't really have the right setups and basically I had only vertical jigged a couple times so I hadn't been doing a lot of that. I was still, but that was on the list to do. And so was the deep dropping thing. So uh, so I was looking around my boat and I was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to make these guys happy? I just want them to have fun. I want this to be a good experience for them. So I looked around the boat. I had maybe like six 20 ounce weights and a one pound lead. Guys, I just want to let you guys know that I'm ju I was just starting out, and leads were expensive, and everything that I made on my charters, and I was 
I went back into the fuel and I was just really just getting started in the, in the business. So I didn't have a lot of money. The money that I was making, I was going right back into my business, into my boat to, to make upgrades and gear and stuff and leads and sinkers, you know, they were, they're, they're, they're expensive. <laughs> so anyways, so I had a few weights, these heavy leads laying around and I had a couple of, um, big spinning reels that were loaded with braid. And now at that time I had like, I think I had like seven or eight Jimmy jigs that I had, you know, that I had for samples. And I was thinking about getting into the vertical jig business and I just had them laying around the boat. I hadn't really vertical jigged at all. I just was like, Oh man, you know, so, so basically, I just I went outside the hump area, got away from all the boats. I stopped the boat, and I looked at the vertical jigs, and I said, I said the word vertical jig, and drop. I pointed to the weights. I pointed to the vertical jigs, and I have never seen two guys move so fast. It was like they knew exactly what I was saying. And they were like, they were on it. These guys like grabbed the weights. They started making their own. I gave them a, like, I had, I think I had some 40 pound fluoro sitting in the, in, in my box. And I gave them some, some circle hooks and that I had. And these guys started making their own chicken rigs. <laughs> it was like, these guys knew exactly what they wanted to do. They just couldn't communicate it to me. And they knew that I really didn't have a lot of stuff. So, and then, turns out that they had their own bag of goodies and of vertical jigs they had their own stuff for dropping and i was like oh my gosh so but you know i had a couple spinning reels and i was like you know we're 450 some odd feet 600 some odd feet and we started deep dropping and vertical jigging on the hump we're using the the spinning reels that i had uh, these were actually live bait rods, so they're extremely f flimsy, and we were cr and we just th these guys just went to town. I pointed to the um, bonito and the squid in the cooler. They grabbed the squid and grabbed the bonito. They started cutting up their own bait. Um, I had no GPS numbers. I was just like, okay, so I was looking at the map, the fishing map on the contour line where the hump drops, and. I had I had no clue to even where to start, and at that time my sonar system wasn't working the greatest. It was like on its last leg, and I was just really just using the sonar at the time for um, I wasn't really using it. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you. I just used the maps. I kind of just figured out where the fish were gonna where the fish were at using the contour maps, and I didn't use the sonar for bottom fishing at all because I didn't really need it when I yellowtail fished. I mean, you don't need a sonar for yellowtail fishing, guys. So you just got to know where the fish are at and have the chum. But they're either there or they're not. And, but I didn't use it because I didn't wreck fish. And I didn't um, deep drop at the time. But that was the plan. So somehow I, like, started going around the hump and I tried to get this my sonar to work to where I can kind of dial in so I kind of made started making adjustments on the fly and and we started dropping with the spinning rods and that were loaded with like 30 pound braid and and we had 40 pound um, chicken rigs and we started and th these guys were started ripping these fish off the bottom <laughs> it was crazy we ended up catching like some really big gray tile fish, yellow eyes, snappers, snowy groupers, the, the, the big ass amber jacks. We caught some toros. Uh, we were cranking them up from the bottom using these um, spinning rods and, and live bait, or using the live bait spinning rods. So I was like, okay. So I put together a trip that day. And the next day I said, you guys want to do it again? They're like, yes, um, I, yes, yes, yes. So I mean, yes. So they they understood. So I kind of knew what they wanted. So the next day they show up, they have all their own gear. These guys went and they bought stuff. They knew exactly what they wanted to use. They went and bought lead weights. And, and one guy even bought, went out and bought a rod and... I put together. I did have a electric reel that I was that I was planning on kite fishing with and starting to learn that with that I'd never used. <laughs> it was just because you know I just 
was still new and I just had like I was planning on doing it. So I was like, ah, better bring it and see if these guys know how to use it. And I showed up with that electric reel, man, and those guys' face just started like it lit up. These guys grabbed that electric reel, put it all together, and they started doing the same thing. And then I gave them, then, you know, they started, they didn't have, they had a few vertical jigs, but not a lot. And, but I had like some sample Jimmy jigs. And because, like I said earlier, I was planning on getting into the vertical jig game. And these guys, then one guy was vertical jigging. When he got tired, he went back to the electric reels. And I did the deep drop in. When he got bored with that, he went and grabbed the vertical jigs. And it was just a, it ended up to be a, fun couple days <laughs> that's what started out was kind of crazy just kind of and i learned a lot from these guys these guys were these guys are really good um really good at deep drop and then they started showing me pictures of what they've done overseas with the with the deep dropping and the fish that they catch and and i was like holy cow man these monster wreck fish and the groupers i never even like knew existed but they were good fishermen i was like yeah you know so <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I, another thing that they that they did was kind of crazy. Was they started making what the um, these what I call um, fruit roll ups. <laughs> so what they did was they took pieces of squid because there's a lot of pesky bottom fish. They were getting pissed. So and well, this guy pulled out this like this floss wrapping out of his tackle box, and he started wrapping the squid and bonito chunks together in tight little. Um, like I don't know, they start. He's they just like tight little rolls. Like um, and then what he did was he tied them all together, and he and he made like a I don't know, like a stinger rig, and he inserted it into like a two hook bottom rig, and boom, he dropped this squid. I called it I called it a squid roll up because that's what it looked like. It was a piece of squid wrapped together with a bonito chunk and it made it like impossible for these pesky bottom fish to rip these pieces apart and what was happening was he'd feel the peck 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 and just like you do when you're bottom fishing and you know using a knocker rig and you and you feel them peck 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 then all of a sudden the big grouper grabs a hold of it the same thing was happening he was feeling these fish bite 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 and he'd pull it away from them and then the big like the snowies would go nuts for it so they would see that action on the bottom happening like the old saying goes, action brings action, and the squid roll-up just that these guys were putting together were just crushing it. So I learned something new that day. I was like, so I I was doing that for a while when I got first got in the deep drop, and then I, I just couldn't find the right floss, and then it got to be kind of time-consuming, and it was, um, but man, the fish that I caught after that using that that. You know, I call it the squid roll-up was, you know, kind of crazy. But so after those two days of fishing, I, I still didn't learn any Italian. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I learned that there is an international language of fishing. And once, and it's kind of like, it's kind of weird, but if you point to something and you kind of make hand motions and, start saying words things kind of click together in a fisherman's brain and it doesn't it's it was really quite interesting but like, like i said after those two days uh I, my the, like my brain was on fire i was i said i needed to do something i needed to add this to my charter routine but i was still very new and i wasn't confident in implementing it because i wanted to make sure that i knew how to do it uh, correctly and efficiently so after those two days with the Italians, I started putting a little money away after each trip so I could save for electric reels, high-speed conventional reels, and the correct reels for um, vertical jigging and the correct rods for vertical jigging, which is another story for another time. So I put together a development plan for myself on how to uh, implement vertical jigging and deep dropping into my charters uh, over time. And I always say things happen for a reason. So it just so happened that the dolphin migration started changing at the time that the Italians, after the Italian trip, the migration patterns were shifting. There weren't as many dolphin around. And when they were around, they were way out of my reach, 1,000 foot. And then people started, you know, it was just kind of um, getting to be. The fishing was getting really weird 
and the water quality was starting to get bad in Florida Bay. And so, guys, I took literally two years, maybe three years off from doing any type of dolphin trolling. And I spent very little time yellowtail fishing, setting the hook and yellowtail fishing. And I focused on vertical jigging on my charters. I focused on deep dropping on the charters. And like I said, and I started learning a little bit about live bait. And how I fell on the live bait was kind of interesting. I would, what I would do is to try to add a little bit of, um, add a little, little bit of more diversity to the trips. I'd start bringing a little bit of live bait along. And like I mentioned before, the, the dolphin fishing was kind of null for those couple of years. It's kind of a, like a blessing because I didn't feel like I needed to like the dolphin trips that I were getting. And I was like, eh, you know, there's no dolphin. So I was able to take them deep dropping and vertical jig. And we, and we caught a bunch of fish while everybody else was coming home with nothing and bitching. So, but I would say nothing, but they were catching some fish. But there were days guys were driving out 2,000 feet of water round trip, you know, 65 miles with nothing to show for it. So, but that year I was like deep dropping and while I was deep dropping, I was catching dolphin. The dolphin were swimming up to the boat. I was like, what the hell? And I was throwing out flat lines and catching dolphins on pilchards that were swimming up to the boat. So I learned a lot about the migration patterns that year on where to find fish on extremely tough days and times because, you know, dolphin or mahi mahi are are like birds, man. They're migratory. They come back to the same spots at the same time of year when the conditions are right. They swim different highways. So I learned about a lot about the highways while I was doing this and where to find fish, dolphin, on tough days <laughs> and how to go about doing it. So sometimes it's better off that you let the fish come to you rather than going and looking for them on those tough days and make plans to do something else. But like I said, I spent two to three years of doing nothing but deep dropping and bottom fishing, focusing on learning that, that fishery. Now I have to admit, sometimes it was painful because when the dolphin did show up, I, you know, I had to try to, you know, sometimes I had to force myself into like saying, Hey, you know, we're vertical jigging today. And most of the clients, nine out of the 10 clients were extremely happy to have their hands on the rods and the reels instead of trolling for the fish, which I felt like, whoa, you know, that opened my eyes too, is that I realized that a lot of people want to be active on charters, not just sit there and wait for the rod to go off. And I seen a trend in this. I did. More people wanted the vertical jig, bottom fish. They wanted the activity. They, and some, most of these people that, that were chartering me, they didn't really give a shit if they caught a dolphin or not. And I was like, well, I thought that you know, the way I was brought into the industry was like, in the summer, you troll for dolphin. That's what we do as charter boat fleets. And I was like, okay. So I kind of fell into that pattern of doing that. And so I just followed the routines of what the other guys were doing. But when the fish didn't show up and I was like, well, I, I can't like have people be unhappy. And a lot of people still wanted to catch big fish. They wanted to catch tunas, and they weren't happy with going back and setting the hook. They still wanted to be active. They didn't want to sit there and, and fry in the sun, catching yellowtail snappers. So I started catching big fish, vertical jigging and deep dropping. The people were extremely happy. And once in a while, I'd get a yellowtail client, but not very often. And I was like, uh, if, as, if I gave them the option of going vertical jigging over yellowtail fishing, they were extremely happy with that. And they didn't care about how many fish they caught or how many they racked up. It was more about the experience for them and, and catching big, like the fish that they caught were nice and the action. And the European clients that I got, man, I was like, wow, these people are, the Europeans are tough when it comes to charter boat fishing. But when I started like throwing in the vertical jig mix and you know the bottom fishing, the deep dropping, and the level of excitement from the my European clients were was awesome, and they come back now. Whereas you know, most of the Europeans are like they can be tough, like I said, when it comes to fishing. But you give them a style of fishing that they that they want that involves being active. It's 
they're going to come back. They're coming back to see me. I just got an email from another guy. And remember, he said in the, he said in the email, remember, no trolling. No trolling, Ryan. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, my gosh. Another reason for this podcast. But in other words, there's like for me, it's like I wanted to diversify. I love the dolphin fish. I love the dolphin hunt. But it's really, for me, it's not about me on my fishing charters. It's about my client and what they want to do. Not about me and and racking up big dolphin and posting them up for pictures. I when you look at my Instagram photos, the my clients are um, extremely happy in those photos because number one, most of the clients there they want to have their hand in the photo catching mutton snappers and and all those amber jacks and African pompanos. It's an active fishery, man. They the action is really good. You know we're using live bait. And they're not sitting around waiting too long. We're moving around. We're hustling around. Everybody's got their hands on the rods. And whereas when you're trolling for dolphin, it can be kind of like, eh, you know, kind of boring. They're like, oh, you're taking me on a boat ride. So, but the rewards can be really good in the month of May and June when the bigger fish are pushing through or if you find a piece of wood out there or when the schoolies are around, you can, the clients have an awesome time casting and, and so forth. So, but I'm kind of getting off topic, but I think you guys are understand what I'm trying to say. So anyways, that's the story. And what started out as a, like a negative, uh, what I thought was going to be a negative experience with a, a couple guys that didn't speak any English turned out to be a very positive experience for me. That particular charter really just lit a spark underneath me to move to the next level and to learn a different style of fishing. Sometimes you just need that li- little bit of push, and that was enough push for me. And you don't know when that push is going to come, but when you feel it happen, uh, I highly suggest that you trust your gut, especially because that's what that's how a good fisherman builds instincts is based on your gut. It's not going – an instinct is um, – it's something that's just going to come to you, and sometimes you just got to do it. And you have to trust your instincts because that's what's going to catch your fish. So what made me think of this story? I, I said that at the beginning. Um, well, I got an email from my buddy Carl, a good client of mine. He's over in Tampa. He, Carl is always he's a super good guy. Really appreciate um, having him in my life and... Sometimes people come into your life for certain reasons, and I th- think Carl's there for a reason it's because he does. Um, it's always good to have somebody that's not in competition with you, that is, you know, communicates and very professional, and is always, you know, trying to send me a tip or I'm sending him a tip, and it, it's a good, good relationship, and I really respect that. So. It, Anyway, so I get an email from Carl. I, I got up in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. He sends me an email. So in his email, Carl says, hey, have you tried this product called a bait wrap? And, and oh, my gosh, the, when I heard the word bait wrap, the first thing that came to my mind was the, um, the, the Benito and Squid fruit roll-up that the Italians made. And I just was started laughing at them in my head. So he sent me this link to this product called bait wrap and and they're made by mossy head bait company put the link up in my show notes for you guys to check out what it is is basically you 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 can put a piece of meat into a um, a mesh sleeve and you 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 put the hook onto the mesh and the fish you know peck at it and and it's hard for them to get the bait and i think it's it's it looks like it works really well for um certain types of bottom fishing like sheep's head fishing um, deep dropping for vermilion snappers you could put a large piece of soft squid in there it'll be hard for the those pesky fish to rip the squid off the hook when you're throwing at um when you're throwing at trunks of trees out there and the fish are um you get all those little um, amber jacks and and uh, all those pesky file fish that are getting to your bait before the mahi have a chance to get to it so Anyway, so I ordered um, I ordered some of the wraps to try out, but I ordered some the, the wraps that I ordered were too small, so I've got to order some larger wraps. And I think these things are going to work. I'm honestly, I'm pretty impressed, and they're they're very simple. 
I know guys use, use guys used to use pantyhose. They used to use like cheesecloth to do this. They use the rigging floss. The Aussies are the king at using floss and mash, and the, and the, so are the guys that carp fish and salmon fish. And a lot of good, there's a lot of good concepts and ideas you guys should should research for saltwater fishing from like guys that freshwater fish for carp, especially over in in Europe. Uh, guys that fish in Australia for the for snappers, they have all sorts of like wrapping mechanisms that uh, and bait that they use, and that would that would work here as well. It's a little bit complex, but the, it looks highly effective for what they do when they what they call I think it's called stray lining snappers, similar to us flat lining. They just call it stray lining, I think. Um, so once I try the product out. Carl's had really good luck with it. I just haven't had a chance to mess with it too much because I just haven't been deep dropping and just, and I need to order the new mesh, but like I said, I just haven't had enough time and it's on my list, but I'm going to do that in June. So once I get that done, I'll, um, you know, I'll post up the results from, but you know, check them out on YouTube. It's uh, I think it's, it's, um, bait wraps.com. But like I said, I'll, I'll put the um, information up in my show notes. So if one of you guys tried it out first or have tried it, send me some pictures. Let me know what you guys think. Does it work? I did email the Moss Head Bait Company, and these guys were very responsive. So, so far, I'm very impressed. They gave me lots of tips on how to use the wrap and tips on bait and all that good stuff. So far, their customer service is A+. Plus, so um, you may want to give them a shot. I don't know. Look at do do your own research, and if you decide to do it, you know, give me a shout. Let me know what you what you, what the results are. But also, I want to give a shout out to Steve for the phone call the other night. Hey, brother, I really appreciate you tuning in and, and the kind words. The more people, like I said, that listen out there, and you know, that are following me on Instagram and all that good stuff, the more I'm going to share with you guys. So that's that's kind of like my fee for you know, some of the tips that I'm going to be doing, but. Like I said, the more uh, more people that share the podcast and the more viewers that I get, then the you know the more information I'm going to give out to you guys. But, anyways, thanks for tuning in, and I'm going to leave you with one of my all time favorite one liners this time. And those of you that have known me for a while know that I used to toss this one around. But um, be that fisherman that leaves the small fish for the boat behind you. Have a good one, guys. Thanks for listening. And as always, please let me know if you have any questions. You can email me at goodkarmaryan at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook at Good Karma Fishing Charters. Now, if you want to keep up with my daily catches and new projects that I'm working on, then I highly encourage you to follow me on Instagram at goodkarmasportfishing underscore FL keys. And please also share this podcast with a fellow angler and check out my website, goodkarmasportfishing.com, and sign up for my monthly newsletter and free fishing tips. I aim to provide you with fishing tips and information so you can make the best out of your time fishing. Thanks for listening, and remember, anytime you're fishing, it's all good.